it gives me great pleasure to uh, have this opportunity to talk to you about something that's very important to the field of spondylitis. It's really transformed the evaluation of this condition and it's really enabled us to make a lot of advances in the field. So uh, for a lot of people, including physicians, MRI is a little bit of a black box in that we know it gives us some important information, but exactly what it tells us and how it helps in the assessment of a patient isn't really very, very clear. So that's what I hope to do in the, this uh, webinar, is to discuss the advances in the field. And so what I'm going to do is to first of all just outline some of the important unmet needs in the field of spondylitis. So one of the problems and challenges that physicians have is that of course back pain is extremely common in the general population. And it's often very difficult to do an evaluation, a clinical evaluation, that, that easily distinguishes between spondylitis and all the other causes of back pain. Uh, so for example, somebody with a slipped disc can experience a lot of the same symptoms as a patient with spondylitis. And then when we look at the labs that are used to evaluate patients, um, the tests that we get uh, that are available do not specifically indicate whether a patient has spondylitis or not. The B27 test, for example, and many people will be familiar with the importance of the B27 gene towards the diagnosis. This is a gene that in fact occurs in the normal healthy population in about 10% of North American Caucasians. So it's a normal healthy gene, but it is present much more frequently in patients with spondylitis. So we don't really have any tests that really clearly specifically distinguish spondylitis from all the other causes of back pain. If we rely on x-rays, this just is not good enough. They're not sensitive enough. And it often takes quite a while before you can see definite changes uh, of spondylitis on an x-ray. And of course, a patient may suffer with a lot of symptoms for many years before the diagnosis becomes apparent on an x-ray. Moreover, um, there are changes on x-ray that can mimic spondylitis. So for example, women who have had children will have changes in the pelvic bones in x-ray that look a lot like spondylitis. And so this can be um, a problem. Um, and increasingly it's been recognized that as for many conditions, early treatment is the best treatment. That's when we get the best treatment responses. So we really do want to identify patients early. Uh, we want to recognize the cause of symptoms early so that we can uh, provide appropriate treatment. Then once a patient's diagnosed and, and, and we know that the patient has spondylitis, um, we are often also want to monitor the effects of treatment. And so we rely on what people tell us about the severity of the symptoms, but of course, just because a patient has spondylitis, does it mean that they can't get a muscle sprain or a prolapsed disc or some other back problem? And sometimes it can be hard to tell if a patient's symptoms and let's say increasing severity of symptoms is due to the spondylitis or some other cause of back pain. And so it's important for us to have the ability to monitor patients in an objective way uh, with, with tools and tests that allow us to distinguish 
active spondylitis from other causes of back pain. This is a problem right now because we don't really have that many tools to monitor people. We have a, a lab test called the C-reactive protein or CRP for short, but this just isn't sensitive enough and about 50 to 60 percent of people have a normal CRP both at the time of diagnosis and during follow-up. And it may also, for this reason, be difficult to determine when's the best time to start a biologic. We, of course, want to start a biologic um, when a patient has active disease. But we also want to be sure that the severity of the symptoms and not due to some other problem, for example, like a slip disc. So it's important to have these objective tools uh, and tests that really tell us that a patient has spondylitis and that the spondylitis is active. Uh, and then increasingly, what we really want to know is which patients are more likely to get severe disease uh, over follow-up. And the sooner that we can make that determination, the better for the patient. Um, you can well imagine that if we can make this determination very early on, then we might then be in a position to introduce effective treatment right from the start instead of waiting for the disease to get worse. And this is what we mean by precision medicine. Everybody's disease course is going to be a little bit different. Some, are some people are going to have a mild disease and others may have more severe disease. So we really want to be in a position to practice precision medicine. And of course, um, the Obama administration has recognized this and has talked about supporting research into tools and the development of tests that will allow physicians to practice precision medicine, the right treatment for the right patient at the right time. And our current labs and x-rays for spondylitis really do not allow us to, to practice precision medicine because they really don't tell us anything about the future course of spondylitis. So here's a good example of the challenges of evaluating spondylitis using uh, an x-ray. And I've shown this x-ray during workshops to a lot of uh, rheumatologists and I asked them, do you think that the patient has spondylitis? Uh, yes, no. And I often get a 50-50 response. There's some people, some rheumatologists say yes, and some rheumatologists say no. And if you look on the left side, what you should see in a normal healthy joint is what we in fact see, and that's two nice parallel lines that indicate that the joint is healthy. Uh, on the right side, however, you can see that those nice parallel lines are not as evident. Things look a little bit fuzzy, and this is very early spondylitis uh, on the right side, but not on the left side. On the left side, the joint looks normal. It's a beautiful x-ray that shows the difference between abnormal and normal. And as I just indicated, it's often very difficult indeed in such an early case of disease for rheumatologists and radiologists to make a clear-cut distinction between what's normal and what's abnormal. So that's the problem with the x-ray and this patient has already had symptoms for six years and um, of course it would have been nice to have treated this patient with the kind of effective therapies that we have uh, so that they would not have suffered all this time with back pain and could have had a normal quality of life with the kind of treatments 
that we have now available. So I'm going to discuss the basics of MRI. What is it? And I'm going to show you some examples of MRI and then how we used MRI in patients to help understand their disease and provide appropriate treatment. Now, I'm sure many of you on the webinar understand something about picture formats on a computer. And so we have, for example, a JPEG image. I think many of you will have heard of what a JPEG image is. So we send family photos around uh, as attachments to emails. Uh, probably many of you who are savvy with social media don't bother with that, but a JPEG is an example of a picture format that's very easy to attach to an email and send around to family and friends. Some of you may also be familiar with a TIFF picture format, which is a very high resolution picture format that's used in publication uh, to all kinds of journals. Now the kind of picture format that we use for MRI is completely different. It isn't something that uh, a regular computer can, uh, can show on the screen. You need special software to show a medical image. And the name of that picture format is DICOM. And that stands for Digital Imaging and Communications in Medicine. And hospitals all over the world now, they, the, the images that they store, the images that they create from x-rays and CT scans and MRI, they are all in this DICOM image format. And what happens in hospitals all around the world is that there are these electronic PAC systems. PAC stands for Picture Archiving and Communication. And what it is basically is it's an electronic library and the software in these systems allows medical images in DICOM format to be stored in uh, hard drives. It allows uh, images to be retrieved, for example, when a radiologist wants to take a look at an image and report it. Uh, it's something that can be seen on an electronic medical record. When I see patients in the clinic, in the outpatient clinic, I pull up the DICOM image from that patient and I can show the image to the patient and we can discuss it. I can show the spine, I can show the sacroiliac joints, we can talk about what it shows and does it show spondylitis or not? Or alternatively, does it show some other cause of back pain? And I do this as a routine in my clinic from one patient to the next. And this provides patients with much more information and allows them to make much more informed decisions about treatment and how they should manage the condition. And so these DICOM images are readily available and they can be sent using a broadband communication to doctors in other locations for second opinions, for example, to evaluate images. Now these are very large files and you cannot attach these to an email and send them by email, for example, um, they are only transmitted through secure broadband connections to maintain patient privacy. And um, these are available uh, to communicate between specialists at different hospitals, for example. Uh, so that's what MRI first is. And this is now just still uh, regular pictures. Uh, this isn't DICOM yet. I'll come to a DICOM format picture very shortly.
but I just wanted to show you what an MRI image shows compared to an x-ray. So this is a young man with two years of back pain and on the left hand side here is the x-ray of this patient's sequiliac joints and the x-rays actually look completely unremarkable but when you look at the MRI um, and there are typically two types of MRI and one type of MRI is very sensitive to water we call this a stir MRI so there's the stir picture the stir MRI and uh, its sensitivity to water is um, important and it's an important uh, tool because water accumulates wherever there's inflammation so um, you know when you get sw a swollen joint uh, that's typically reflecting a lot of accumulation of water because blood vessels in the joint become very leaky because of all the inflammation and fluid accumulates in the joint and the sacroiliac joint is no different but where the, cum the fluid accumulates is in the bone around the joint that's why it looks so bright in this joint, the sacroiliac joint so even though the x-ray looks quite normal the MRI is already very very abnormal and shows the accumulation of water related to inflammation now a second type of MRI we call a T1 MRI this tells us a lot about damage to bone uh, this is an erosion it's telling us the inflammation is so intense that we're starting to see uh, irregularity of the bone as the severity of the inflammation starts to chew away and dissolve the bone and this is what we see uh, already happening in very early disease and eventually erosion of the bone, the dis dissolving of the bone can become quite severe uh, so we use two types of MRI, what we call a T1 MRI, which tells us about the uh, dissolution of bone and erosion of bone. And the STIR MRI, which is very sensitive to water, which tells us in a very sensitive way when inflammation has started, even before an X-ray becomes positive. Um, I think review the cases and then perhaps do a few more questions once we've gone through the cases. Just be before I review the cases, I should just mention that a lot of rheumatologists are not very familiar with the concept of DICOM imaging. Um, evaluation and interpretation of MRI is not something that is taught in medical school for rheumatologists or in specialty training programs. And that's something that we're trying to change. And in particular, we have been working with the Spondylitis Association um, to um, organize workshops to help train rheumatologists and uh, help them to become familiar with DICOM imaging and the assessment of MRI. And this also applies to uh, radiologists. And our first workshop um, in uh, Los Angeles was very successful indeed. And we had a great deal of interest and very positive feedback and confirmation that this really was indeed a very important unmet need that was being fulfilled by the SAA. So let's move on to our first case. Uh, this was a very interesting young man who uh, is a male champion marathon runner. And he was having increasing difficulty running and found increasing difficulty even with simple tasks like sitting and standing for prolonged periods. He was starting to feel quite um, uh, disenchanted with over-the-counter therapies. We went to see his family doctor who had tried 
naproxen and diclofenac. Um, so these would be um, agents such as uh, um, Arthrotec is another name for diclofenac. And naproxen is the active ingredient of Aleve. Uh, so these are typical anti-inflammatories that a family doctor might use as first-line treatment for spondylitis. He had a physical exam, which was completely normal, and uh, he was tested for B27, and he was shown to be positive. And he had a, the test for active inflammation that I mentioned earlier. The blood test is CRP, and his CRP was normal. So what we're going to do now now it just switch to his x-ray and this is his x-ray and you can see on the left hand side his left sacroiliac joint was completely normal the right side showed some questionable abnormalities and certainly not decisive and he was continued this X-ray was in fact reported as normal. And he was continued on anti-inflammatories and then uh, was referred for rheumatologist assessment. And um, this is when he had an MRI. And this is, is, I'm going to show you some of the remarkable capabilities of all that I'm able to make, in fact, and move the image around. I'm interested in some particular, I'm interested in something over here. Okay. Of, I'm going to have to ask you to use your imagination a little bit and think of slicing through salami and think of all those slices, those consecutive slices of salami. And so imagine making those cuts from the front to the back of the joint. So right now I'm going to start off. You can see some white bits here uh, at the front of the joint and we often see fluid on the right hand side. This is the water sensitive MRI and on the left hand side here this is what tells us about bone and So I'm at the front of the joint now, and I'm going to go from slice to slice. From the front to the x-ray through the joint, you just get a 2D image. But here, I'm going from front to back and back to front, and I can do a very, very detailed assessment. I'm going through all the slices to the back of the joint. And what I can see in this joint, I'm going to show you what the abnormalities are in a minute. But I just wanted to go through the principles of MRI so that you can understand what it allows us to do. So it allows us to look through a lot of thin slices. Each slice is only three to four millimeters in thickness. So you can see that as I go from front to back, there are what, about 10 or 12 slices, all very thin slices, uh, the salami slices, of the joint from front to back. So that's the first advantage that the MRI gives us. The second is the ability to magnify 
and look at exquisite detail in the joint. I've already mentioned how MRI detects these abnormalities before pelvic x-ray. And in addition, you're able to of the image to clear a picture of uh, what is happening. Using that I can download from a PC or a Mac. So this viewing software, or as we call it, DICOM viewing software, allows the radiologist or the rheumatologist to now look at medical images that are based on DICOM format. And we can manipulate these images in ways that I've shown you Look at all these thin slices of these MRI images going from the front of the body to the back of the body. And so as you can see, we can evaluate about 20 or so slices from the front to the back. So you can see that's an enormous advantage over the single image that a pelvic x-ray provides. Now, what I'm going to now show you is some of the very specific abnormalities in runner. So the first thing that we see is there's already this irregularity of the bone. And we can see the bone is, there's a gap in the bone. It's like it's been chewed away. So these are what we call erosions. Uh, you can see another gap here. This is another erosion. See more erosion on this side here. So in fact, this person, this patient, has already developed this erosion of the bone in the sacroiliac joints. He doesn't have too much inflammation. You can see on the, the water-sensitive MRI, because the inflammation probably happened already uh, several months back. And what we see is the consequences of the inflammation, the damage to the sacroiliac joints. You can see just how irregular this is. I'm going to blow this up. Irregular, that bone has now become. Okay. So this is really bone that's really been chewed away by the inflammation. Now, there is a happy, happy ending to this story. This patient received treatment with a biological therapy because the diagnosis was unquestionable based on the MRI. This patient is now back to marathon running. So I'm going to now describe another case, and this has a definite Canadian context to it. And this is a Canadian Royal Mounted Police officer who's 32 years old who fell off his horse. Um, they don't normally go around the streets of Canada on horses, uh, but this was a parade and uh, the horse uh, became a little too excited. And ever since then, he's had trouble with back pain. And he's been told that, you know, well, you fell off a horse, what do you expect? And was told that this was due to injury. And he went to see his family doctor and had a lot of uh, complaints, mainly he couldn't sit for very long, was feeling stiff, um, couldn't really walk very much on the beat, and had some response to, again, the anti-inflammatories we discussed before. And now his pain had become so severe that he'd gone off work on disability. Um, really wasn't too much to find a physical exam. And in fact, even his B27 test was negative and he had the inflammation test done, the CRP. This was just borderline normal. And he had an X-ray that was reported as normal. And basically because he was now on disability and really had exhausted a lot of the options for treatment, he was referred to a rheumatologist. So this is his um, x-ray, 
And again, it's an X-ray that shows that on the right side, he's got nice, clean margins to his joint. On the left side, looks like there might be some irregularity there, but here's a problem. So what you see are these shadows. That's actually gas in the bowel. And of course, bowel sits in the pelvis and often overlaps the sequiliac joints. And it can real, really cause problems with interpretation of the sequiliac joints. So this, this is actually difficult to interpret because there's some overlying gas shadow. So the x-ray, not surprisingly, was reported as normal. Let's just have a look at what his MRI shows. And now we're again at the front. And we're going to go through our salite to the back of the joint. And on the right-hand side is the water-sensitive MRI. You can tell it's the water-sensitive MRI because you can see the normal fluid, the water, in the spinal canal. So we're right at the back of the body here. And I'm going to go to the front of the body. What was abnormal in this patient that led to the correct diagnosis? Now I'm going to make the image just that much. So now we have a much nicer looking detail to clearly understand what the problem is. So now what we have on the water sensitive MRI here, the right hand side you can see this bright signal here, bright area. This is telling us this patient has inflammation. here. Go through the next to the next slice and we're going to see the still this bright signal and then and to the next slice now we see more of this bright signal over here and over here and in the bone here. So on both sides of the joint this is the the dark line is the margin of the bone of the joint. So we see this bright area here, that signifying this patient has active ongoing inflammation. There's a little bit on this side as well, but it's mostly on this right side here. We go to the next alarmy slice, and here we are, even more inflammation in this joint on this side. Another area here on the next slice is about five of these slices that have inflammation in the joint. So again, this was a patient who, who was diagnosed as having I'm going to show you what the spine look, looks like here and what spine. So the spine, the salami slice is a little bit different. They, the slices go from left to right. So you can see the individual vertebrae, okay? This is the water sensitive MRI because you see the signal from the fluid in the spinal canal. So each one of these are lumbar spine vertebra. And lo and behold, we have a bright area here in one of the lumbar spa, in one of the lumbar vertebrae that has this signal indicating inflammation in the vertebra. So this patient had inflammation not just in the sacroiliac joints, but also one of the vertebral corners here. So this patient had inflammation in both locations. Who's bent? What this looks like, see that bright signal of inflammation in the patient's sequiliac joint. Back to riding his horse or not, but he certainly went back to work and he's continuing his work as a police officer. 
So this is what it looks like after inflammation has resolved. You can see the enormous detail that we get and how we can be confident with the diagnosis and what happens after treatment to inflammation uh, once it's properly recognized, diagnosed, and appropriately treated. So I'm going to go back to just one more case. And so ice hockey is a big deal in Canada. And um, yesterday was a fantastic game that I saw between the Edmonton Oilers and the New York Rangers. Happy to say the Edmonton Oilers won 6-5. So uh, this was a case of a 42-year-old male hockey referee, and he had acute back pain after falling on the ice. And he presented several months later because he was developing numbness in his leg. His back pain had actually improved somewhat, but was still there and was still troubling him from time to time. He was taken over the counter a leave, which, as I mentioned before, the active ingredient is naproxen. And he was concerned that maybe he'd trapped a nerve or had some nerve root impingement in the spine. So he had an x ray done in the x ray department, and uh, the x ray of the lumbar spine was normal. And he had a blood test called the SED rate which some of you may have had done, it tells us something about inflammation. The SED rate was a little high. It should be less than 20, and his was 32. So um, he was referred to a rheumatologist for further evaluation. This is what his x-ray looked like. The rheumatologist was a little bit concerned um, the rheumatologist was me. And I was a little bit concerned about this because while I thought his left side looked normal on the x-ray, I was really rather concerned that his right side did not look normal. And he tried several anti-inflammatories and he was still getting a lot of back trouble. And I was really thinking that he would probably need to go on a biological treatment to get adequate relief. So what did his MRI look like? I'm just going to again optimize this so that you can see the end picture a little bit brighter. on this side, all the salami slices, it's a little bit sharp, well, side a little bit brighter. And as we go from front to back, through all the slides, too dramatic, but we do see a little bit of faint signal, bright signal on the water sensitive MRI. And I talked to the patient about treatment and the fact that I thought he had inflammation in his joints and that he might benefit from a biological treatment. So we looked at this MRI scan together in my clinic, and he wasn't all that impressed with his MRI. And he'd gone to the internet after we had our discussion, and he read about some of the side effects about biological therapies, and he decided that he wasn't going to go ahead with treatment, and uh, that maybe he wasn't ready at this point to start treatment on a biological therapy. Uh, we had a discussion over the phone and I reassured him that the latest information was very reassuring 
about the safety of biological therapies, but he really wasn't ready yet for treatment. And he decided he was going to try conservative treatments like more exercise. He was going to lose a few pounds in weight and uh, he was going to stop smoking. I encouraged him in all of these endeavors because certainly smoking is a major risk factor for severe spondylitis. And then he came back to see me in six months time and he said, you know, I'm really not getting any better. And, uh, you know, I've lost uh, 15 pounds. Uh, I've tried to do exercise, but it's hard for me to exercise when I'm in pain and I'm not sleeping well. I'm waking up in the later hours of the morning and my quality of life has really become quite poor. So we repeated the x-rays and he said, you know, I'm still worried about these uh, biologics. We repeated the MRI. Look like now. So again, it's so we can can see this and follow up the images a bit, a bit brighter. Don't really need to to optimize the inflammation we review the image. See the inflammation now is yes. And we can see a lot of bright signal on this water sensitive MRI. And it's really very obvious on lots of slices now, on at least six slices, where we see this bright signal in the bones around the joint. But it's really become very obvious. And we sat down and looked at this image on the MRI. He said, you know, we're going to go ahead and we're going to start treatment. And um, he really did very well indeed. His pain really uh, improved substantially. I'm happy to say that um, he continued with changes to his lifestyle, very positive changes to his lifestyle. He's lost weight, he stopped smoking, his symptoms are much better controlled. He can exercise now, whereas he could have before. And it's really made a huge impact on his quality of life. And the imaging really was very important in helping to reassure him that this really was an appropriate treatment step for him. And this really was the way to go. Um, so all of these have an important uh, and happy ending. Um, they show how we can change management and how we can prove, improve people's lives with appropriate uh, recognition of this disease, its severity, and provide appropriate treatment.